So here we're going to talk a little bit about uh, diff, uh, not differentials, but uh, crown and pinion uh, gear tooth contact patterns. We're going to start off with that. And then we're going to talk about how we uh, change the pattern if the pattern is not where we want it. So normally with a crown and pinion contact pattern, What we're looking at is where the gear on the pinion is contacting the gear tooth on the ring. So when you got a crown and pinion gear set, when we're taking a look at the actual gear tooth on the ring gear, there's going to be some terminology that we need to know first off. And if we look at the profile of a gear tooth, where the gear tooth is something like this, <clears throat> if we were to split that gear tooth up, and look at uh, the approximate pitch line of it. The top and the bottom, we have some different terminology we normally associate with that. The top over here, the tip of the tooth, and the root, we'll usually call the face and the flank. So the tip and root of a tooth, face and flank, when we're talking um, diff contact patterns and we say we got too much face contact, we mean that the contact between the pinion and the ring gear is too far towards the tip of those teeth. That's not a good thing because that means we're probably gonna end up wearing off that, uh, that gear tooth and we're gonna have uh, quite a knife edge on that in a very short period of time. The other thing that we can look at, and this here would be a side profile of the tooth. And if we're talking about, um, you know, the gear tooth here on a ring gear, if this here is the inside of the ring and this is the outside of the ring. So the inside and the outside of the ring there, um, we have some uh, terminology again that we associate with that. The outside would be the heel and the inside would be the toe. So now we have a way to kind of divide that gear tooth up into four quadrants. And if we divide it up into four quadrants, where again, this here would be the tip and this would be the root of the tooth, that would mean that we have the flank, the flank and the face. When we have a good contact pattern on a gear tooth on our uh, crown and pinion gear set, we want to have that contact pattern centered along the pitch line. You'll notice that I didn't draw that contact patch centered between the toe and the heel there though. And there's a reason for that. This is a spiral bevel gear set and just like any bevel gear set, the more load you have on the gears, the more they want to force apart. And as these, uh, as these gears force apart, as the load increases, the contact patch tends to grow and move outwards towards the outer edge of that tooth or towards the heel, I should say. <clears throat> if you have the contact patch perfectly centered, what can happen is the contact patch that we were trying to have ends up effectively extending beyond the edge of the tooth. And that's how you end up with the corner of your teeth breaking off on your crown gear. So it's important that we have our contact patch uh, centered along the pitch line. So basically even between face and flank, uh, biased a little bit more towards the toe so that as the load increases on the gear, <clears throat> the pattern is gonna move a little bit more towards the heel. So now that we know what the terminology is and what part of the gear tooth we're referring to, we should talk about what adjustments affect where that pattern's gonna sit. Because when it comes to uh, crown and pinion gear set patterns, there's really only two things you can adjust. One of those things is pinion depth. And the other thing is backlash. So pinion depth, you adjust that by moving your pinion in and out 
backlash, you adjust that by moving the crown gear side to side. If you move the crown gear closer to the pinion, you reduce backlash. If you move the whole differential assembly over further away from the pinion, sideways away from the pinion, you increase backlash. So when it comes to your pinion depth adjustment and your backlash adjustment, um, those two things, they're going to uh, impact the, uh, the pattern in different ways. Okay. Could you just go over uh, again what movements on the pinion and ground gear equals what? Absolutely. Um, when we're talking about pinion depth, uh, the pinion depth is going to move your pinion in or out based on which way you shim it. And that's going to change your uh, face and flank. It'll change the, uh, the, the contact. And let me grab, just trying to grab a different uh, color pen here so we can see. So if my contact is too high or if my contact is too low, that means I need to move my pinion in or out. Okay, so pinion depth, face, and flank, okay. My backlash, that's gonna to tend to affect the pattern more um, towards the inside or the outside in terms of heel and toe of the circle of the ring gear. Okay. So backlash, heel. So, all right. So when I've got uh, a heel or toe problem, face or flank problem, uh, that's the reason why we run those patterns so we can see where it's touching so we know what we have to adjust. And when you're making these adjustments, typically we're gonna start off by adjusting our pinion depth first. And then after that's done, and then we set our backlash just to finalize where that pattern's sitting. So <clears throat> let's assume that I've got uh, a pattern, I run a pattern, I find out that I have too much face contact. So if I got too much face contact, that means that the tips of the gear teeth are touching and I wanna drive those gear teeth further together. That's what it really means. So to get that to happen, I have to move the pinion in if I got too much face contact. If I got too much flank contact, that means the gear teeth are driven too far together and the contact patch is too close to the root of the teeth. And if you think about your ring and pinion as a simple bevel gear, that means you're gonna to have to just pull those gears apart a little bit to move that contact pattern closer to the pitch line of the gear. When it comes to heel and toe contact, Again, heel and toe, if I got too much toe contact, that means everything's too close together. And that means my backlash is too tight. If I got too much heel contact, everything's too far apart, my backlash is too loose. Okay, so if I got too much heel, I wanna reduce backlash. If I got too much toe, increase backlash. To increase the backlash or to reduce the backlash, that means I got to move the ring gear sideways by shimming the carrier bearings, or my maybe by turning some adjusting screws that uh, you know move the bearings back and forth. But if I got too little backlash, I got too much toe contact. I'm going to want to move some shims so that the ring gear moves away from the pinion. If I got too much backlash, I'm going to want to move some shims or turn some screws so that I move the ring gear towards the pinion. So for pinion depth and backlash, your face, flank, heel, and toe, uh, this is stuff that you're definitely going to want to know and understand. This is stuff that um, when you're going through, um, if you're writing your Red Seal exam, uh, there's a very good chance that you're gonna be asked some diagnostic questions uh, with regards to where that pattern is sitting. And if it's incorrect, what you need to adjust to get to the correct pattern. So the next thing I wanna talk about here is, uh, we'll start with ping and depth adjustment. OK, 
Okay, and your ping and depth adjustment. Um, there's there's two different ways that the ping in might be uh, mounted to your axle housing, your diff housing. One way might be integrated. Another way might be with a, um, a separate ping in carrier. And just to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, imagine how the ping in would typically sit in uh, the uh, in the rear end of a tractor. All right. So you have the uh, the rear housing, your diff housing there, and your ping in and the bearings associated with that. They just slide into that housing. And you have to shim some bearings back and forth to get your ping and depth set correctly um, so that it's sitting proper in the housing. Now take a look at the front wheel assist or maybe the axles on a four wheel drive in certain circumstances or drive axles on a semi truck. On those ones, what you do is you unbolt a carrier that has the bearings and everything mounted and the ping and everything inside of it. And it's that ping in carrier with its bearings. You shim that entire carrier in and out to set your ping in depth. There's two different ways of doing it, right? So we're gonna talk about the integrated first. So with an integrated pinion carrier, um, that means that the adjustments that we have to do to get our pinion depth set correctly, is gonna be a little bit different than if we had a removable carrier. So we'll start off with a simple drawing here And this is going to be, we'll just keep this simple. There's our pinion. There's the crown. Okay. So for the pinion, to move the pinion in and out, I have to do that with shims. So we're going to start off by drawing the bearings. And the bearings that we typically have, you're going to have your actual bearing here tapered roller bearings. And we're going to have a race. So your bearing race and the actual bearings, they sit like so. Now these are going to be sitting inside the housing. Now this housing this could be you know, your transmission housing. It's not uncommon to have some shims sitting right there. The shims that are sitting there behind the uh, rear bearing race, those shims are the ones that adjust ping and depth. If you take a look at the other end of this, uh, this ping and gear here, On the other end of the pinion gear, you're gonna have the housing again, okay? You're going to have your bearings and just let me look at this here. And then you're gonna have the roller bearing. Okay, and that roller bearing, that's typically held in place by the yoke. Okay, so there's your yoke. And you know, maybe this yoke is, uh, you know, bolted on with a bolt. Okay, so yeah, there we go. Now we're bolted on. All right. There's another set of shims usually on this side. If you're not using a crush sleeve, there's usually another set of shims on this side. And those shims typically go here or maybe they go in between, you know, the yoke and the shaft. There's, there's gonna be shims there somehow. And the purpose of those shims is to uh, set your bearing preload, all right? So when we're looking at something like this, if you change your pinion depth, that's going to affect the bearing preload. So you're gonna to have to change the shim pack for the bearing preload on something like this. So right there, if you're, if you're looking at order of operation with your pinion depth and bearing preload on an integrated pinion carrier, 
you're going to have to set your ping in depth first and then set your ping and bearing preload after. And then you're going to set your bearing, you're going to make sure that your bearing preload is set correctly on the uh, differential, um, the differential carrier bearings. And then you're going to uh, swap shims from side to side on the diff carrier bearings to set your backlash. Order of operation questions are very common uh, when you're writing your IP exam. Um, so try to uh, try to keep that in mind, that order of operation that you need to follow. Okay. So now that we've uh, talked about this, let's take a few minutes and talk about something else. Um, your integrated uh, versus your removable pinion carrier. With a removable pinion carrier, you can, the housing there is removable and it just bolts into the axle housing. So what you're gonna wanna do there, your ping and depth um, shims, they're not actually behind the bearing race at the back. They would be between the housing, or sorry, the, the ping and carrier and the axle housing. So if you had a removable ping and carrier, your shims would be here. And those shims, those are your ping in depth shims, okay? But that right there is the uh, depth adjustment on a removable carrier only. All right? On the standard integrated, everything here in blue, that doesn't exist. All right. So here's another thing that I want to talk about. Ping in depth markings. So ping in depth markings, sometimes you take a replacement uh, crown and ping and set out of the box and you look at it and on the end of the ping in, there's some numbers scribed. And those numbers, they might look something like this, minus 0.003. or maybe something like this, plus 0 0.002. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> when we're manufacturing components um, on you know, a mass production scale, a few things happen. First of all, the tooling that we're using to machine gears, it wears as it's being used to machine those gear teeth. And that means the tolerances and the dimensions of the gear teeth are going to change if we use the same tool over a period of time to machine several sets of gears. The other thing is there are different manufacturing tolerances as well. Um, so there may be slight variations from one part to another. Taking that into consideration, manufacturers know that if they do have a matching uh, crown and pinion gear set, um, as long as we can match any of those variances one to another, uh, we should have optimal gear tooth contact pattern, you know, if we have the pinion at a certain pinion depth. So what does this really mean? Well, if I take a look at a typical crown and pinion gear set where this is my crown and this is my pinion, okay? If I want the proper contact and I'm just gonna pull some numbers out of the air here. And I'm gonna say that the uh, nominal, you know, center line of that ring would be somewhere around there. Um, so just, just for an easy point of comparison, let's take a look at the nominal running radius. If this was a 10 inch uh, uh, running radius on, or sorry, uh, running diameter on this, your running radius would be about, you know, five inches. Okay, so that five inch running radius, that would mean that if everything was perfectly machined to manufacturers, you know, original specified dimensions, if you had the perfect gear set with a pre-established shim pack, that shim pack that we talked about, you would have the perfect face and flank contact. You'd have the perfect pinion depth, okay? And let's say that that shim pack there, 
was, you know, maybe 10 thou. So your nominal shim pack would be 10 thou for uh, a gear set that runs at that five inch running radius. The problem is manufacturing things, um, you know, we have sometimes uh, better contact if we move the pinion in a bit or better contact if we move the pinion out a bit. And that's where the numbers for your uh, ping and depth corrections come into play. So on a certain gear set, and let's say that, uh, you know, we had an old gear set that had this minus 0 0.003 stamped on it, and our new gear set has plus 0 0.002 stamped on it. What that really means is the manufacturer, when they made the original one, that, uh, that first gear set, the old one in there, they knew that that thing would run better if it was three thou further in. So that means the correct running radius for the old one was 4.997 inches. The new one is 5.002 inches. So what we need to do is we need to correct the pinion depth so that we're at that new running radius of 5.002 instead of the old one that was sitting at 4.997, all right? What that means is I actually have to move in this scenario here, I have to move the pinion out. How far? Five thou. So I'm moving the pinion out five thou to get it to the correct running radius for the new gear set that I'm putting in. And the way to do that, if I wanna move the pinion out, just remember we had a bearing race that was over here. I think I drew that backwards, my bad. We have a bearing race right here that was shimmed into position with the ping and depth shims. So I need to move this thing out. So that means I've actually got to remove 5,000 of shims. If you have an integrated pinion carrier and you take a look at the numbers minus 0 0.003 or you know plus 0 0.002, if I have a minus 0 0.003, that means I actually had to add 3,000 shims off of nominal to get where I needed to be. If I got a plus 0 0.002, that means I actually had to pull 2,000 shims to get off of nominal to where I needed to be. It's a little counterintuitive until you understand the reason why those numbers exist. When it comes to uh, setting up a crown and pinion gear set, always check those numbers. Because if you check those numbers and you make the correction to the shim pack during that first step of assembly, then you don't have to tear the whole thing apart again just to change the shims because your um, face and flank contact was incorrect. By making that correction at this point to the shim pack, uh, there's a far better chance that you're gonna be right where you need to be on your face and flight contact right off the hop. Take a look at the markings on your old gear set, take a look at the markings on your new gear set and adjust your shim pack accordingly. Okay, the next thing that uh, we're gonna talk briefly about here is what happens uh, on a diff carrier Okay, so your diff carrier is going to have the ring gear mounted on it. Okay, it's going to have some bearings mounted on it. And those bearings are going to ride against some races. When those bearings ride against the races, the way that we set the bearing preload is by adding shims behind the races. Those shims behind the races, they're held in place by a cover. And that cover may be bolted to, again, the axle, the axle housing, I should say. So when I bolt this on, and there's my bolts.
all that that's doing is just forcing the race in. And we do the same on both sides. And once my, my preload is set, then I need to check and see if my backlash is correct. So my backlash is just looking at the relationship between the ring gear and the pinion. Okay, so there's my pinion, there's my ring gear. So my ring gear, if there's too much distance between the ring gear and the pinion, I have excessive backlash. And that means that the diff carrier is too far to the left. So to correct that, I need to move the pinion carrier to the right. To get it to move to the right, I have to pull shims from the right-hand side and add them to the left-hand side to reduce backlash. You'll notice that I'm not removing shims and adding shims. I'm just changing which side that shim is on. Okay. So for instance, if I need to reduce my backlash by 5 thou, and it just so happens the geometry is such that by moving a 5 thou shim, that changes the backlash by 5 thou, I take that 5 thou shim from the right side, put it on the left side, that reduces my backlash. So this is true as long as the bearings are mounted like I've shown here. The bearings are not always mounted like that. Sometimes the bearing race is mounted inside of a quill. And the quill is like a separate housing that your bearing race is going to sit inside. And again, I've only drawn, you know, one side of this, which is equivalent to that. This quill gets shimmed in and out to set your preload. So if I've got two quills, so I got another one over on this side. And I have, you know, the corresponding race on this side. And I've got the shims over here. If I wanted to uh, increase the bearing preload, I have to remove shims. Over here, if I want to increase the bearing preload, I have to add shims. Okay. For backlash, If I want to reduce the backlash in my top example here, that means I need to move shims. Uh, according to how I have it drawn, I have to move shims from left to right. Or sorry, from right to left, my apologies. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm pulling shims from the right side and placing them on the left side. That's gonna reduce backlash. Uh, if I have quills that hold the, uh, uh, the actual bearing races in place, uh, then over here, if I wanna reduce backlash, Okay. So if I, want to, if I want to reduce backlash here and I want to move the uh, diff carrier over, uh, that means that I have to pull shims from the left side and move them to the right side. Depending on how the bearing races and your differential carrier bearings are retained inside the axle housing, it's going to mean that what you do to increase or decrease preload is going to be opposite between the two. What you do to increase or decrease backlash is going to be opposite between the two, depending on the style of system that you have. So if you're coming across any scenarios where you have to make these adjustments, you'd better be aware of what style of uh, mounting system we're talking about so that we know what we need to do with the shims in order to get our backlash and our bearing preload where we want it to be. All right.
So if we take a little scroll up here, we can see that we've gone through the contact patterns and terminology, which way we need to move the pinion and the backlash to increase or decrease our face flank, heel and toe. We've talked about setting pinion depth with either removable pinion carrier or an integrated pinion carrier. We've also reviewed uh, how to identify and interpret what pinion depth markings mean and how to adjust our pinion depth shim pack um, to compensate for those changes in the numbers. And we've talked about how to set our differential carrier bearing preload and how to move our shims from side to side to adjust the backlash.